Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. As always, we're so glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. And tonight we're returning to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we're continuing with our brand new study of the book of Deuteronomy. This will be our second week in Deuteronomy. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Deuteronomy chapter 3. We'll be looking at Deuteronomy chapters 3 and 4 tonight. As always, if you have any questions about class, any comments, uh, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. Or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274. Good news, uh, Sunday I said during the sermon that if you uh, had any sources for papyrus to let me know, and thankfully I have found a papyrus dealer right here in south central Wisconsin over in Mount Horeb. And so I'm looking forward to sharing what I believe is an interesting story about the... Um, uh, procuring some papyrus for the Four Lakes congregation uh, uh, went all out with uh, five dollars and uh, had an interesting talk with the guy. So hope you can join us this coming Lord's Day as we talk about the writing of ancient books and uh, plan on taking a look at some papyrus. But as I said tonight, we've just started a new study of Deuteronomy. Last week we learned that Deuteronomy is basically a series of farewell addresses from Moses to the nation. And the book is basically a repeating of the law as the new generation prepares to cross over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. So Moses, as a leader, is now on his way out. Joshua, the younger man, is getting ready to take over. And so an entire generation now has died out in the wilderness. And this new younger crowd needs to hear God's law again. They need the reminder, as all of us do. And we noted last week that Deuteronomy emphasizes the law, the love of God. So it's not just a, a cold, hard, legal document. This is not like reading some uh, letter or some ruling from the IRS. Not like that at all. But it's a book where Moses just encourages the people by reminding them of God's love. And I would say throughout this book, Moses is basically begging these people to love God in return. Please, no matter what you do, do not turn away from the Lord. God has been so good to you, and we need to respond with appropriate worship and obedience. So last week, we looked at the first two chapters of Deuteronomy, where we started looking at the first of several speeches delivered by Moses to the nation. And in the first half of that first speech, Moses reviews the history of God's people in the wilderness. And we learned last week this was basically a trip that should have taken 11 days. And it was stretched out, though, over 40 years due to a lack of faith on their part. And we learned how the people decided to press forward without God when they heard that. Um, when they heard they wouldn't be allowed to enter the promised land immediately, and we saw them just uh, get uh, defeated in battle terribly as a result of that terrible decision they made. And so we have that. Also in that chapter, Moses reviews how the burden of leadership caused him to delegate some of that responsibility. And of course, we know, uh, based on reading the previous books, this was as the result of getting some advice from his father-in-law. And uh, thank God for a good, uh, good fathers-in-law. But uh, we learned also how the people moved closer to the promised land near the end of the 40 years and defeated Sihon, king of Heshbon. And Sihon's defeat, of course, was something that made a huge impression on the people of Jericho. And so years later, they would understand this. They would see what God had done to Sihon, and they were terrified that they would be next. And that was kind of, in, I guess, the recent past for them at that point. So we've covered the defeat of Sihon. That's kind of where we left it at the end of chapter 2. So this brings us now to the second half of Moses' first speech or address to the nation in the book of Deuteronomy. So let's pick up with Deuteronomy 3 as Moses continues to summarize what has happened in the wilderness. So this is going to be Deuteronomy 3, and let's look at verses 1 through 11. Deuteronomy 3, 1 through 11. Then we turned and went up the road to Bashan, and Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, came out to meet us in battle at Edrai. But the Lord said to me, Do not fear him, for I have delivered him and all his people and his land into your hand. And you shall do to him just as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lives at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered Og also, king of Bashan, with all his people into our hand, and we smote them until no survivor was left. We captured all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we did not take from them, sixty cities, all the region of Argob, 
the kingdom of Og and Bashan. All these were cities fortified with high walls, gates, and bars, besides a great many unwalled towns. We utterly destroyed them as we did to Sihon king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. But all the animals and the spoil of the cities we took as our booty. Thus we took the land at that time from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, from the valley of Arnon to Mount Hermon, Sidonians call Hermon Syrian, and the Amorites call it Sinir. All the cities of the plateau, and all Gilead, and all Bashan, as far as Selka and Edrai, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, was left of the remit of the Rephaim. Behold, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. It is in Rabbah of the town, sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits, and its width four cubits by ordinary cubit. Well, at the end of Deuteronomy 2, if you remember our review, we, we just saw the, the conquest of Sihon. And now we have the defeat of Og, the king of Bashan. They, are, they conquer Og at God's direction, and at God's direction they kill everybody, just as they were instructed. And I know that's hard for us to hear. God had his uh, ideas on this. He had his reasons for doing this. But again, as we've recently noted, this seems to have been uh, compiled by someone other than Moses. So Moses is giving the speech, but, you know, Moses said these things. But it seems that somebody else wrote this down and compiled it later. And, and I kind of mention that again now because we got this thing in verse 8. The author refers to these things or these kings as being beyond the Jordan. Well, that doesn't make sense. They were on the east side of the Jordan. So I, I think somebody is putting this together now on the west side of the Jordan. And he's referring back to what happened previously beyond the Jordan, which is where the people now are as Moses is speaking. Anyway, at the end of this passage, we've got an interesting note concerning um, King Og's bed. You know, today we generally identify beds as being, uh, what, twin size, queen size, king size, California king or whatever, singles, doubles. Uh, but here, um, when they go conquer Og, they make a note that his bed is huge. And I just find that interesting. So soldiers, they're going in, they're clearing out these towns, and they're like, look at what we found over here. Um, Og's bed was made of iron, so they point that out. Apparently that was unusual, uh, but it was also quite large. I think that's the most impressive thing about it. Nine cubits long by four cubits wide. With the cubit being 18 inches, that means Og's bed was roughly six feet wide by 13 and a half feet long. So Og and his people were apparently quite large, and I know we've had some references to giants in the land, and this seems to be another one of those references for this guy to have a, a bed that big. But, you know, giants are no problem to God. God can handle that, uh, as we're going to find out later with uh, David and Goliath. But let's continue tonight with Deuteronomy 3, verses 12 through 22. Kind of the next section here, Deuteronomy 3, 12 through 22. So we took possession of this land at that time from Aror, which is by the valley of Arnon, and half the hill country of Gilead and its cities I gave to the Reubenites and to the Gadites. The rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, I gave to the half-tribe of Manasseh. All the region of Argob concerning all Bashan, it is called the land of Rephaim. Jer, the son of Manasseh, took all the region of Argob as far as the border of the Geshurites, and the Machathites, and called it, that is, Bashan, after his own name, Havath Jer, as it is to this day. To Machir I give, gave Gilead, to the Reubenites and to the Gadites I gave from Gilead, even as far as the valley of Arnon, the middle of the valley as a border, and as far as the river Jabbok, the border of the sons of Ammon. The Arba also, with the Jordan as a border, from Chinnereth, even as far as the Sea of the Arba, the Salt Sea, at the foot of the slopes of Pisgah on the east. Then I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess it. All you valiant men shall cross over armed before your brothers, the sons of Israel, but your wives and your little ones and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, shall remain in your cities, which I have given you, until the Lord gives rest to your fellow countrymen as to you, and they also possess the land which the Lord your God will give them beyond the Jordan. Then you may return every man to his possession, which I have given you." I commanded Joshua at that time, saying, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. So the Lord shall do to all the kingdoms into which you are about to cross. Do not fear them, for the Lord your God is the one fighting for you. 
Well, in this passage, Moses is just summarizing really what we just learned a few weeks ago near the end of the book of Numbers. That was the situation where the tribes of Reuben and Gad had asked to, uh, you know, have the land east of the Jordan and Moses allowed it. So they conquered that land, I think kind of unexpectedly for them. That's not really what they were looking for. But hey, look, uh, they got a lot of space here. We've got a lot of flocks. So how about if we just kind of hang out here? And the conclusion was, as long as the men of those tribes helped conquer the land on the west side of the Jordan, um, they could do that before they go back to their new homes on the east side. So that was kind of their, uh, not really a compromise, but this was their way of dealing with uh, potential whining and the, uh, the potentiality of everybody saying, well, let's just not cross the Jordan at all. Let's all stay over here. I think that's what Moses wanted to avoid. But anyway, he kind of recounts this again. He kind of gets this in... In writing, he gets this in speaking. This is like a public address. He's making this for everybody to know. And then here at the end or in the middle, we've got some boundaries established. So basically, instead of latitude and longitude, we've got like bodies of water, uh, brooks and seas and that kind of thing are the uh, corners and the edges. So basically, this is the story of how we ended up with the boundaries that we have to this day at the time that this was written. Toward the end of this passage, we then have Moses encouraging Joshua as Joshua, the new leader, prepares to take over. And Moses is explaining that what they've conquered up to this point should be a reminder that God can do some amazing things. And so as you cross over the Jordan, Joshua, just remember God can do for you in the future just as he has done for us up to this point. God will do to the Canaanites what he has done to Sihon and Og. Therefore, do not be afraid because God is fighting for you uh, just as he has in the past. So let's continue then with Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 29. The next chunk here, Deuteronomy 3, 23 through 29. I also pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Let me, I pray, cross over and see the fair land that is beyond the Jordan, that good hill country and Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, Enough! Speak to me no more on this matter. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift up your eyes to the west and north and south and east and see it with your eyes. For you shall not cross over this Jordan." But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go across at the head of this people, and he will give them as an inheritance the land which you will see. So we remained in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Well, here at the end of chapter 3, Moses knows that he's not allowed to cross over, but he, he pretty much begs God to change his mind. And, and you know, God has changed his mind. He has reacted to prayer, maybe a more accurate way of saying that. And, and I know that I've read this before here in this passage, but I just don't remember this part of it. So I'm glad that we read it again this week. And I think we understand Moses' concern here. I mean, Moses was rescued from the Nile River as a baby. He was raised in Pharaoh's household. He spent 40 years in exile as a shepherd in the middle of nowhere. And so at the age of 80, God then calls him back to Egypt to confront Pharaoh. And then he spends the next 40 years... Uh, leading these whiny people through the wilderness. So here he is, nearly 120 years old, and he's not allowed to see them through the next few feet of their journey. They are literally right across the river. And Moses is right there, and it's like, come on, God, can't you please just let me go over? So, I mean, I think we understand Moses' frustration here. Uh, but however, notice, you know, God is firm on this. And, you know, we don't know exactly what God's thinking. We've got the reasoning for it. I mean, earlier in Scripture, maybe at this point they need a new leader. You know, there's a, a time comes when, you know, you've been leading the people for 40 years. This may be kind of the time to let the younger guy take over. Maybe that's the attitude here. Um, but I, maybe as a way of, I don't know, the compromise isn't the best word, but compromise, God will allow Moses at least to go up a nearby mountain so that he can at least look over into the promised land. So God is at least giving him that. And I think that right there is incredibly gracious on God's behalf. Uh, in the next few verses of Deuteronomy 3, God wants Moses once again to encourage Joshua as the new leader. So there is this transition that's in place. It, I mean, it's they're going through it right at this moment as, as he's speaking. This is... Uh, uh, Joshua is in the process of taking over. He's learning on the job. He is kind of the leader apprentice, we might say. 
And so Moses is to encourage him and strengthen him. But Moses, though, will not be allowed to continue over into the promised land. It is going to get turned over to Joshua. So let's continue over into the next chapter now, Deuteronomy 4. And let's look at the first 14 verses. We'll just go ahead and read all of these together, then come back with a few comments chunk by chunk. But Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done in the case of Baal Peor. For all the men who followed Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and so do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we called on him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might perform them in the land where you are going over to possess it. We talked about Deuteronomy being a bit more loving than just a a cold, hard reciting of the law. And I think we see that in this paragraph. You know, once again, Moses is practically begging the people to listen. He's not just reading the law, but he's begging them to pay attention to it. He wants them to cross over the Jordan. He wants them to live. He wants them to thrive. He wants the people to be successful, and so he wants them to neither add to nor take away from God's law. And that terminology, by the way, should be pretty familiar to us. I mean, where else in Scripture do we have a warning, do not add to nor take away from the words of this book? Well, we see that at the end of Revelation, don't we? And I think, obviously, um, that ties in here. There there are some parallels. Well, starting here in verse 3, Moses reminds the people concerning what they have seen, And in this case, he wants them to remember what happened at Baal Peor in particular. That was the incident where the people were seduced by the women of Moab um, at the urging of their king Balak upon the advice of the uh, false prophet Balaam. And so here Moses seems to be, I don't know, congratulating those who didn't fall for it. Like, good for you. You're solid. Um, You know, those of you who held fast to the Lord, you're alive today. And so I think he's saying, remember that. There is a purpose for God's law. It's not that he wants you to be miserable, but the very opposite. God has given us this law to bless us. He wants us to do well. And that's what we see in verses 5 through 8 also. The law itself was unique. The law was amazing. It was given to the people of Israel for their own good. In fact, Moses explains here that outsiders, those who were passing through, maybe from neighboring nations, would be able to look over at the nation And they would be able to look at the law and be impressed by it. These people are wise. These people are knowledgeable. These people serve a loving God based on seeing their law. And so the law itself is righteous. And then skipping down to the last paragraph here, Moses gets back to basically begging the people to remember. Remember what happened in the wilderness. Remember the law. Remember to teach this law to your children and your grandchildren. 
And by the way, I think it's interesting that it's not just the parents teaching their children here, but grandparents are to be teaching their grandchildren. And I know we have that at the Four Lakes Congregation where grandparents have kind of taken on the role of teaching their grandchildren about the Lord. But I mean, after all, in this case, especially dealing with ancient Israel, the grandparents had probably seen a few things that the middle generation hadn't really seen with their own eyes. And so grandparents were to dedicate themselves to teaching their grandchildren. They were to teach them what it was actually like to stand there before Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, as it's sometimes called, when the mountain was on fire. By the way, when they saw this, these people, the grandparents, would have been children themselves back at that time. Remember, everybody 20 years old and older had died. Well, toward the end here, we've got the reminder that Moses was the first man to download anything from the cloud to a tablet. Um, had to sneak that in there at least one more time. We maybe get back to that again next week. But uh, let's continue with Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses um, 15 through 24. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 24. So watch yourselves carefully, since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb from the midst of the fire, so that you do not act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth. And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as today. Now the Lord was angry with me on your account and swore that I would not cross the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For I will die in this land, I shall not cross the Jordan, but you shall cross and take possession of this good land. So watch yourselves, that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you, and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Moses continues to encourage the people to follow God carefully. Again, this is not some cold, hard reading of some legal document. This is Moses begging here. And he's warning here in the first part of this paragraph, it almost comes across like a, like a grandfather, you know, trying to encourage his grandchildren. I mean, he's seen some things and he's saying, please, please, please follow God. He's warning his grandchildren to be careful. And remember, uh, Moses is pretty much twice as old as everybody else here, isn't he? And I'm not too good at math, as you know, but if everybody 20 years old and older has died, that means though 19-year-olds back 40 years ago, how old are they? 59? That means the oldest of the old people in this nation are 59 years old, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb and Moses, who's 120. So we talk about a like a gap in the generations and we're talking decades here. So he's dealing with a much younger crowd. And uh, Moses is quite a bit older than everybody else. So anyway, at the first part of this paragraph, he's warning about the dangers of worshiping anything but God. Whatever it is. Idols, graven images, the likeness of anything. Um, even the sun, the moon, the stars. Don't worship anything but God. And of course, Paul also warns about this in Romans chapter 1. We have a tendency as human beings to worship something. And if we're unclear on what to worship, we'll make something to worship. That's just kind of the way we are. And uh, if it's not God who we worship, we tend to worship whatever. And that makes God angry. God is a jealous God, Moses explains. And some might suggest, well, that's kind of petty for God to be jealous like that. But if we look at it another way, God saved these people. And now they're about to be tempted to worship pretty much anything but God. And God is concerned about that. I think he has a right. Obviously, he has a right to be concerned about that. Well, in the last part of this section, Moses gets back to not being allowed to cross over himself. Um, it's like he's, <laughs> this is really burning, burning him, isn't it? I mean, he's, you know, you people kind of, he's kind of irritated. And he seems to bring it up here again as proof uh, of God being serious about these things. So I think maybe he's saying, 
you know, don't worship graven images because God will punish you. Look what he did to me. He's not even letting me cross over. So if you remember what happened, God told Moses to speak to the rock. Moses struck it instead. And, and I know that's kind of the surface. That's what happened there. But in the process, Moses really took credit himself for bringing water out of the rock when the glory and the praise really should have gone to God alone. And I'm just quoting, I don't have this open in front of me right here, but I think Moses that time said, you know, look now, you rebels, we're going to bring you water out of this rock. So he wasn't giving God the glory. He was kind of, look at what I'm doing for you. And that that's really, I think, what got God so upset at that, that incident. So remember, Moses says, God is a jealous God. God does not share first place. He doesn't take well to being put in second. And we just learned about this in our Sunday morning studies, didn't we? Of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, no one can serve two masters. We are to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and so on. Uh, that started way on back there in the Old Covenant. So let's continue tonight with Deuteronomy 4, verses 25 through 31. Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 31. When you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything and do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long on it, but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. There you will serve gods, the work of man's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress, and all these things have come upon you, in the latter days you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. Starting in verse 25, Moses here foresees a time in the distant future when despite his many warnings, the people will in fact leave God to worship idols. And Moses says God will get angry at that point. He'll get so angry in fact that he will remove you from this land that he's given you reminding us that the land promise was conditional. Some people don't understand that even today. They think that the promised land was given to the uh, Israelites forever and ever with no exceptions. That is not the case. The land promise was conditional. And Moses is saying when God removes them from the land for worshiping idols, he will scatter them to other nations where they will be enslaved again, just as they were down in Egypt. However, Moses explains that if they seek the Lord, if they return to the Lord, that God will remember his covenant and God will remember those uh, promises. And uh, of course, this actually happened, didn't it? We had the Babylonian captivity. They were taken away in waves as they were attacked on different uh, uh, several years apart. But ultimately, they were taken into captivity where they languished for many years until God heard their cries once again and they were restored to the land. Anyway, th I think this may be something that we may need to emphasize more today. I know we often emphasize coming to the Lord through baptism as we should. We share the pictures on Sunday. We explain we got to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and so on. And yes, that's how we're saved. But perhaps we should also maybe pay more attention to what we need to do when we leave the Lord also. Um, because many of us will leave the Lord in our lifetimes at one time or another, and we need to know what to do when that happens. And I think what we need to know is God welcomes us back when we return. You know, when we turn around, when we express remorse, when we demonstrate repentance, when we come back to the Lord and ask for his forgiveness, uh, he is willing to forgive. And that is an amazing thing that we dare not overlook. Uh, some have described this as God's second law of pardon. His first law of pardon is when we're saved originally. His second law of pardon is the process that we go through to be restored to the Lord once we've fallen, uh, fallen from grace. It is possible to return, and we're extremely thankful for that. All right, let's continue with Deuteronomy 4, verses 32 through 40. Deuteronomy 4, 32 through 40. Indeed, ask now concerning the former days which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and inquire from one end of the heavens to the other, 
Has anything been done like this great thing or has anything been heard like it? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you have heard it and survived? Or has a God tried to go to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war and by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm and by great terrors as the Lord did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, he is God. There is no other besides him. Out of the heavens he let you hear his voice to discipline you, and on earth he let you see his great fire. And you heard his words from the midst of the fire, because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in and to give you their land for an inheritance as it is today. Know therefore today and take it to your heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and on the earth below, there is no other. So you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I am giving you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may live long on the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Well, this is the end of Moses' first speech to the people. This is his conclusion. And he closes by telling them to ask around. You know, if you doubt that God is awesome, just ask around. Ask anybody. Nothing like us has ever happened anywhere at any time. God has blessed this nation beyond what any other nation could ever imagine. No God has ever done this for any other people. You know, we heard him speak from the blazing mountain. We survived. He brought us out of Egypt. He did these amazing things. He spoke to us from the fire. He gave us a law. And now he's brought you here and he has given you this land. And so you guys need to keep his commandments for your own good so that you can live in this new land for a long, long time. So this is how the first speech ends. And personally, I wish the chapter had ended here as well. I wish this was the end of chapter four. Uh, however, the chapter divisions are man-made. I'm, I'm hoping I'll remember to get back to this in our study of how we got the Bible. Like, how did we end up with chapter and verse divisions? I think that'll be a part of our study. Uh, but I think they messed it. They, they messed with this on this one. They, they missed it. And because uh, we have two more short paragraphs that really, in my opinion, should be a part of chapter five. I'm not criticizing God. I'm criticizing the guy who made the divisions here, which definitely wasn't God. So let's just conclude tonight with Deuteronomy 4, 41 through 49. The last two little chunks here. Deuteronomy 4, 41 through 49. Then Moses set apart three cities across the Jordan to the east, that a manslayer might flee there, who unintentionally slew his neighbor without having enmity toward him in time past. And by fleeing to one of these cities he might live, Bezer in the wilderness on the plateau for the Reubenites, and Ramoth in Gilead for the Gadites, and Golan in Bashan for the Manassites. Now this is the law which Moses set before the sons of Israel. These are the testimonies and the statutes and the ordinances which Moses spoke to the sons of Israel. When they came out from Egypt, across the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Peor, in the land of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon, whom Moses and the sons of Israel defeated when they came out from Egypt, they took possession of his land and the land of Og, king of Bashan, the two kings of the Amorites, who were across the Jordan to the east, from Aror, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, even as far as Mount Sion, that is Hermon, with all the Arabah across the Jordan to the east, even as far as the Sea of the Arabah at the foot of the slopes of Pisgah. Well, I know this is review for us since we just studied numbers, but uh, Moses sets up a series of cities of refuge, and he only mentions the one on the east side. I think there were three on each side of the Jordan. But anyway, th these were places a person could flee to for safety if he accidentally killed somebody, kind of a home base. You know, if you got there, you were safe until a trial. So we kind of got a legal system established with, with that. And then in the last paragraph, we basically have an introduction to what comes next in the next chapter. And so again, I, I wish this was thrown in with chapter 5, but it's not. And so here the author is just introducing what will come next, as Moses will go on to give a review of the Ten Commandments. So the last paragraph is basically just giving us uh, some context um, this is where the people are right now, and this is what uh, Moses is about to say next. So uh, this brings us to a place, I think, where we can pause for a week. We've now looked at the first of several farewell speeches from Moses to the nation, 
And next week, we hope to continue with at least chapters five and six. We'll see. I haven't prepared that lesson yet, but we'll get there. And uh, we'll do chapters five and six, um, unless we may, I think we may be out of town. We may have a guest speaker next week. So stay tuned for that. If you only get these notifications on YouTube, you'll need to let me know directly so I can send you a link since we can't uh, link to somebody else's material through YouTube. Usually we send it out uh, multiple different ways. So check with me if YouTube's the only way you get this uh, notification and uh, I'll make sure you get whatever we're doing next week. But thank you for being with us tonight. As always, if there's any way that we can help you spiritually, if there's something we need to be praying about, uh, we want to invite you to reach out. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You guys have sent some good comments and questions over the past few weeks, and I appreciate that. Uh, you can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close our class tonight, let's all go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only Almighty God who brought your people out of Egypt and provided for them in the wilderness. You remembered your promise and you gave them all that they needed and so much more, even beyond the very basics. We know that you are the same God today as you were then, and so we want to ask tonight that you continue to watch over us. Give us this day our daily bread. And give us the way of escape so that we can avoid temptation. Thank you, Father, for being so good to us as your people. As you've instructed, we continue praying tonight for our governing authorities. We pray for wisdom. And we ask that during our transition from one president to another, and as we transition in other levels of government as well, we pray that we as your people may be able to live quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. This, Father, is our prayer. We come to you tonight through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.